there was a fellow I heard about, he was down on his luck and he was looking for work. He saw a sign on a house that said painter wanted. Now this man had a beautiful home, he wanted his back porch painted. And so the gentleman went up and, and the guy that owned the house had budgeted 500 bucks to paint the porch. And so this fellow walks up and he says, listen man, I'm, I'm down on my luck, I, I really need some cash. And the guy said, hey, I, I can get a bargain from this guy. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 50 bucks if you paint my porch. The guy said, you got it, man, I need money. So the guy laughed, all right, gave him two buckets of green paint. The guy said, where's the porch? He said, it's out back. So about 25 minutes later, the man came out and said he was done, and the homeowner said, well, that was quick. He said, yeah, and by the way, that's a Mercedes, not a Porsche. <laughs> it wasn't the bargain that he bargained for. Now, if any of you know me personally, you know that I'm a cheapskate. At least that's the vernacular that my family chooses to use. I like to say I'm frugal, or I'm a good steward. But really, I'm just a cheapskate. But I'm always looking for a good bargain. And it was interesting, I looked up the, the top 10 best bargains in history. Coming in at number one was Manhattan. Now, Manhattan was bought by a Dutch trader uh, many, many years ago for what would have been about $1,000 in today's money. Today, it's worth over $4 trillion. That's a pretty good bargain. Second was Alaska. Secretary of State William Seward led the country to purchase Alaska from Russia in 1867. People thought it was so foolish, they actually called it Seward's Folly. They thought he was an idiot. He wound up buying 586,000 square miles for two cents an acre. That's a pretty good bargain. The Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, with a stroke of a pen, doubled the size of the United States, buying 828,000 acres for three cents an acre. Now, any of those bargains would have been foolish had they not been taken. But I'm going to contend to you that the greatest bargain, the greatest gift out there is the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The central message of the gospel, that, that sinful man, although separated from God, can be reunited with God, can have eternal life, can have a relationship with God the Father, can receive forgiveness of each and every one of your sins by simply repenting of your sins and placing your faith and trust in Jesus. That is a free gift. That is the greatest bargain of all. You would think that that free gift, that great bargain, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus did it all, we don't have to do anything. And you would think that that free gift would be so easy to give away. And yet so many people reject it. So many people willingly go to hell rather than receive Jesus Christ. And we're in a sermon series called Asking for a Friend. Uh, objections to Christianity, some questions that people may have. Um, and, and there's studies have shown there's, there's several basic reasons why people reject Christianity. Uh, week one, we looked at why do bad things happen to good people. And quickly, uh, let Jesus deal with the notion that there are good people, because he said there are no one good. Uh, Jesus is perfect. Jesus is the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus is the only one sinless. Jesus is God. We are not good, uh, but we have a good and great Savior. Second, we looked at hypocrisy in the church. And as I said last week, I hope that there's less hypocrites here today than there were last week. Uh, last week, we looked at the correlation of science and Christianity and how God does not have to be proven, but God has given us proof. Of his, of his grand design and how he is the creator of all things. Today we're going to deal with one of the toughest subjects that anybody can talk about, and that is prejudice, uh, about racism, about favoritism, uh, about bias, about leaning one way towards a certain group or a certain people and leaning away from the other. Now listen, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, then you are prejudiced against other religions. We like to say, well, I'm not prejudiced. In the human heart, we all have prejudice. We, we all do. That's why our hearts need to be cleansed and transformed by Jesus Christ. If you believe that sex should be saved 
between a man and a woman in their marriage bed, then you are bigoted or biased or prejudiced against those who live alternative lifestyles. It's been said that the most segregated hour of the week is that hour of Sunday worship. And that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. The church has often been accused of discrimination. Now, I'm sure that there are some churches that discriminate. We don't, and praise God that we don't. We love Jesus. Everybody is one in Christ. We are one family. We all love one another. But because we're sinners, we need to address these kind of issues. Lest we forget, and lest we start to, to, to drift from the moorings of true Christianity. See, a big part of the church's image has been the problem of prejudice. So when I use terms like bigotry, racism, prejudice, favoritism, they're all interchangeable. And they're all sins. They're all sins in the eyes of God. See, bigotry and racism is both an attitude and an action. It's a preconceived notion that's not based on actual reality, reason, or experience. It's when you see yourself as superior to someone else and that person as inferior to you. And it's going to lead you to treat them differently than others. And let me tell you where the stem of it is. It's called pride. Pride is the idea that you are elevated above someone else. Friends, let me tell you something I learned a long time ago. The ground is level at the foot of Jesus' cross. And he bids all men, all women, all races, nations, and tongues to come to him. And listen, if you're sitting there this morning and maybe you have a little twinge of that in your heart, and, and it doesn't matter what your nationality or your race or your gender is, that, that bias can be dealt with by Jesus. That sin can be cured by Jesus. Everybody likes to pretend that we're totally objective, but the truth of the matter is we're not, but we want to be. We can be, we desire to be, and led by the grace and the power of God consistently, we can be. Now, this isn't just a problem in the modern church. It, it occurred 2,000 years ago. The early church had to deal with the problem of prejudice and bias and bigotry 2,000 years ago. James, the brother of Jesus, was pastor of a church, and he had to deal with this in his own church. In fact, James, out of five chapters, takes an, an entire half of one chapter to address the issue of prejudice. It's in James chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. It's on page 111 of your, 1011 of your Black Pew Bible, and it's going to be up on your screen as well. If you would, I'd ask you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit it down at my feet. Have you not made then distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, <clears throat> you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressor, transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the laws of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love this entire world so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for each and every nation, tribe, and tongue. We thank you, God, for the transformation that you make in our heart. You come in and you take a heart of stone and you turn it to a heart of flesh, one that beats 
for you, one that overflows with your love and grace and mercy and expresses that in love for others. God, I pray that your spirit will sear our conscience today, Lord, with your love, with your mercy, with your grace. Convict us, Father, in areas that we need conviction and comfort us, Lord, in areas where we need to be comforted. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Now, when we think of bigotry, excuse me, when we first think of bigotry, the first thing that we think of is in terms of race. Uh, but in this particular case that James is talking about, the prejudice uh, was, was of influence and achievement, not of ancestry. But as you're going to see, what James said to the church applies perfectly to any kind of bigotry that we would experience today, whether it be racial prejudice or racism. And James does us a huge favor. He tells us what a bigot is, he tells us what a bigot does, and he tells us why any form of bigotry is not a misdemeanor in God's eyes, it's felony. Number one, he tells us bigotry devalues a life from God. I love James because he gets right to the point. Uh, he, he, this is shirt sleeve Christianity. He, he, he pulls no punches. Verse one, my brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now listen, to be clear, uh, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, any kind of bigotry, racism, prejudice, favoritism is wrong. But they are especially wrong for those who call Christ Jesus their Lord. There is no room in your heart for hate. Because if the love of God fills your heart, uh, the, the two are mutually exclusive. Uh, they, 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 can't, they can't occupy the same space. And so the more love that you have for God, the more love you're going to have for other people. You see, bigotry and belief, redemption and racism, and faith and favoritism cannot go together. In the Greek language, that word favoritism is a combination of two words. One word is face, and the other is to grab hold of. So literally, it would be taking hold of a person's face, which means that you're going to judge someone strictly based on what you see on the outside. Now, we've all heard our mamas tell us all over through the years, never judge a book by its cover. And that's what James is telling us. He's telling us that if we truly have faith in Jesus Christ, we're never going to judge another human being based on what we see on the outside. As a matter of fact, if every human being were a book, the same thing would be stamped in big gold letters on the outside, made in the image and likeness of God. We have one parent. <laughs> the first parent was Adam and Eve. We all came from the same folks. It's sin that has separated us, not only from God, but from one another. And we need peace with God before we can have peace with ourselves and then peace with each other. And in the church, there is no room for racism or bigotry or partiality. You see, the, the color of people's skin, the way they're dressed, how they look. If you judge people by that the majority of the time, you're going to be very, very mistaken. And it's going to be a tremendous mis misjudgment. There was a judge trying to select a jury for a trial one time, and everybody kept giving excuses why they couldn't serve. And his patience was running low, and he looked at one prospective jury and said, juror and said, why can't you serve on this jury? And the man said, well, Your Honor, I'm prejudiced and I'm biased. And the man said, why? He said, well, took one look at that man in that suit, and I am convinced that he's guilty because he simply looks guilty. The judge said, you idiot, that man's not the defendant, that's his attorney. <laughs> you never know. Favoritism is used multiple times in Scripture. Romans 2.11, uh, the Apostle Paul says, God shows no partiality. Paul uh, used it, Peter used it. It's actually found several times, but it's actually plural in Greek. It literally means acts of favoritism. Now, James is dealing here with people being prejudiced against poor people and biased in favor of rich people, uh, which applies to any kind of bigotry and bias. We don't make determinations on pe of people based upon external factors. We all discriminate just for different reasons. Now, there's been five areas that have been determined where human beings discriminate. The first one is basis of appearance. Studies have shown that we tend to favor people who are good-looking, who are taller, who have nice straight teeth. Uh, the basis of age. Old people look down their noses on inexperienced young people. 
and young people look down their noses on old-fashioned, seasoned people. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming much more sensitive to the seasoned side. <laughs> the basis of achievement. We tend to hold the CEO of a company in higher esteem than the guy who drives the truck for the company. The basis of affluence. Uh, we idolize people who are rich and famous and ignore people who aren't. And then finally, on the basis of ancestry, we look at people of color one way and another people of color a different way. But do you know that from the very beginning, God proved himself to be a non-discriminator to people based on their outward appearance? Now, I want you to think about this. What color was the skin of Adam and Eve? We don't know. Somebody would say, oh, well, well they were Jews. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Their, 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 their nation of origin was never told. They were part of one race, that is the human race. Now, if you look at a picture of, of Adam and Eve, what color are they always? Pasty white. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> That's right. If you see any of the, the Renaissance pictures of Jesus on the cross, blonde hair, blue eyes, white skin, I would say that more, if you remember Robert Powell from the Jesus of Nazareth movie that I grew up watching, he probably looked more like Adam Sandler. Now, he didn't act like Adam Sandler, but he probably looked, he was a Jew. Uh, and so Jesus was a Middle Eastern. He would have had olive colored skin. He would have had dark hair. Now there's a greater point to here. The reason God doesn't bother to tell us what color Adam and Eve were is because God does not look on the outward appearance. God does not equate value with skin color. You see, Adam and Eve didn't have value because they were a part of any race except the human race. The human race is the crowning jewel of God's creation. Made in the image and likeness of God with intellect, emotion, and will. We communicate, we write, we make music, and we use all those things to worship our great and mighty God. Animals don't do that. We are special in God's eyes because we were created in his image. Now, this is a good place to share something that I learned this week when I was doing some, some research. It's going to enlighten us that what is actually affirmed by something we find in the Bible. Genetic research shows us that the races are not really as different as we think. Regardless of your skin color, human beings are not that different at all. What we call racial characteristics are only minor variations among all groups of people. If you were to take any two people in the world, scientists have found that the basic genetic differences between those two people would typically be around 0.2%. These racial characteristics are, are the things that we think are major differences, uh, like skin color. That only accounts for 0.012% of human biological variation. We know that all human DNA is 99.9% .9 identical. The most remarkable thing about the genetics of the human race is how little diversity it contains compared to animals. In other words, to distinguish or discriminate among groups of people on the basis of race is not just spiritually wrong, it's scientifically dumb. There is no scientific or physiological reason to distinguish between anyone just on the basis of their skin color. It's wrong because God says it's wrong. Martin Luther King once said, we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. One day we will learn that. We will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. Amen. There is nothing big about bigotry and there is nothing righteous about racism because it devalues a life from God. Second, bigotry dishonors the love of God. Now James describes specifically what is going on in his church. Verse 2, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Now imagine this, you're at James Church there in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. People are streaming into the church. Uh, good, good morning, Brother Jehoshaphat. How are you? Hello, Hiam, how are you? 
Everybody's shaking hands, and all of a sudden, uh, somebody pulls up in a Mercedes chariot. He's got a, a Gucci tunic on. He's got on Prada sandals. He's blinging out. He's got his diamonds. His ring. He, he's got a Rolex sundial on his wrist. And people are parting ways like the Red Sea. They, they ushers escort him down to the, the front. Here you go. You sit in a place of honor. And then the next guy walks in. He's shabby. He's smelly. He doesn't have any shoes on. And they say, you get in the back and sit down. That still happens today. Uh, we still see that preferential treatment today, whether it's the tattooed forearm or the pierced nose or, or the braided hair, whatever it is. We make these distinctions based upon outward appearances. And just, just to let you know, your pastor's not adverse to tattoos. I'm just saying. I'm not telling anybody to go out and get one. I'm just saying you might be surprised. See, when we lift up what is on the outside, we put down what's on the inside. And God says we should not do that. James says, verse 4, Have you not made then distinctions amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? See, the Bible tells us that bigotry is not just weakness, it is wickedness. Bigotry is, bigotry is not just a problem, it is a poison. Because when we judge people based upon what's on the outside rather than what's on the inside, we do something that God doesn't even do. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. A man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Peter knew this. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 says, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. God shows no favoritism. Do you know why? Because God loves everybody. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. amen. You know what that means? If God loves everybody, it means everybody can love God. Who is welcomed into the family of God? Everybody, because God loves everybody. If you love God the way that you ought to love God, you will love others the way that you ought to love others. And if God loves everybody, then you are to love everybody. If you love everybody equally, then you will look at everybody equally. In fact, one of the ways that you can be assured that you love God and know God is that you are going to look at others the way that God looks at others. And he looks at them with love. He hates their sin, and he will not allow it into heaven. But he sent his son to die for them. And that makes them valuable. And you see, the way that we look at people and the way that we treat people may actually hinder them from coming into the kingdom of God. That's why we're talking about this uncomfortable subject today. Because sin is like cancer, and it has to be dealt with. You don't gently pull the cells out. You take a knife and you cut big, wide margins and get rid of it so it doesn't come back. And some of us have to check our hearts. We have to look in our hearts and see how big the margins need to be as we peel the, the roots of racism and discrimination out of our hearts because there's only one solution to bigotry and racism, and that is love. And that's why James said, verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. See, if you're really looking at every person as your neighbor and you love your neighbor, as God does, bigotry, bias, and prejudice, that will make all of that disappear. It'll all go away. See, James calls it the royal law because really it's the king of all laws. See, when, you, when we realize that, then we realize how small bigotry really is. Because at the end of the day, the ultimate solution is not legislation, it's transformation. Uh, Larry Hogan, when he was the, the, the governor, he, he, he passed a law against Asian hate crime. Well, that's wonderful. That's great. Uh, but in my opinion, my humble opinion, I don't give my opinion very often, I believe that all crime is hate crime because it's a crime against a person made in the image and likeness of God, regardless of whether they're Asian or African American or Caucasian or, or of European descent. We're all in the same boat, friends. We all desperately need Jesus. Dr. King once said the government 
can require a white man to serve blacks at his restaurant and can stop whites from lynching blacks, but no government can force a person to love someone. That requires a transformation of the heart. Amen. I'm grateful for the civil rights movement. I thank God for any and all legislation that makes it wrong, illegal, unjust, to, to be bigoted, to be discriminatory because of what's on the outside of a human being. And I pray for the day that love and only love will do what the law can never do. Bigotry dishonors the love of the God of love. Number three, bigotry defies the law of God. James reiterates his point here, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. See, racism doesn't just break human law. It breaks heaven's law. And let me tell you the problem of racial bigotry. It's not primarily a skin problem, friends. It's a sin problem. It's hating another person made in the image and likeness of our creator. See, the, the, the problem with a racist is not with the, the skin color of another person. It's the sin that's on the inside of his own heart. Because that's where sin is manifest, in our own heart. We look at skin because of sin. You don't believe it? Turn on cable news. Our politicians use race to try to keep us apart, try to separate us. But what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. If we belong to Jesus Christ, we cannot fall into the trap of setting up opposing camps and, and throwing rocks at one another. Under the blood of Jesus Christ, man, woman, Jew, Gentile, we're all one in Jesus. We're all one family under the blood. But see, when, when politicians use that, uh, I said the other week that, that the common denominator in most churches was hypocrisy, that it exists in all churches. When, when, when they start race baiting and trying to divide us based upon race, that is the lowest common denominator of mankind. Don't look at a person's heart, look at their skin, look at their height, look at their looks, look at the outside and forget the inside. Don't forget, Satan was cast out of heaven because of pride. And that's what racism is. It's feeling superior to somebody else and making someone else feel inferior. Now listen, just to show us how terrible a sin this is, James continues, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now you may think that you're a good person because you've never murdered anybody. And you may think that you're a good person because you've never committed adultery. But what James is saying is that if you're guilty of bigotry or racism of any kind, for any reason, to any degree, your sin is just as bad as a murderer or an adulterer. And by the way, back in those days, murder was considered one of the top two sins in the eyes of the people, in the eyes of God. Uh, the blasphemy was a second. Both of these sins could be treated with death. Uh, both of them would receive the death penalty because Bigotry and racism breaks the two greatest commandments. See, if you're a bigot, you don't love God the way you ought to love God. I'm not saying you don't love God. I'm saying you're not loving God the way that you should be loving God, and you don't love your neighbor like you love yourself. Somebody once said prejudice is when a first-class citizen is thrown onto the junk heap of second-class citizenship, and that's what bigotry does. It downgrades people from the way God sees them, and it degrades them from what they really are, creations in the image and likeness of God. See, bigotry can never go with belief. It can't. Because if we truly believe that God is our creator and that we are made in his image and likeness, we cannot treat other people in such an ugly way. You see, that's why Jesus came to die for our sins. There is no bigotry at the foot of the cross. And we can sing a song called Amazing Grace because God believes in amazing grace for every race. And Jesus died for every race because he loves every race. And that's why when you truly come to know the love of God and the God of love, bigotry has got to move out of your heart because there simply isn't any room for it. I remember one time I heard a story about 
Adrian Rogers. He was a great preacher. He went home to be with the Lord in 2005. And a lady came up to him, and she was very proud of her ancestry and her lineage. And she said, Dr. Rogers, I have traced my family, and they actually came over here on the Mayflower. And Dr. Rogers said, well, I've traced my family all the way back to a crooked farmer and a drunken sailor. The crooked farmer's name was Adam, and the drunken sailor's name was Noah. <laughs> See, the truth of the matter is we all come from one man, and his name was Adam. We need to give our hearts and our lives to the God-man named Jesus Christ. We all need to look at each other the way God looks at us, and God looks at each and every one of us the same way, as sinners in need of a savior. Because Christ Jesus is Lord of all, he came for all, he died for all, he loves everybody, he is Lord over everybody, and because of Jesus, everybody can be somebody. I pray that the love of God, the grace of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit is the mighty rushing wind that blows racism right out of our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God that does not show partiality. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much you sent your son Jesus on a rescue mission to redeem us from sin, to rescue us from our transgressions, and to pull us out of our iniquity, Lord, that we can be washed white as snow and restored to that original condition that you originally made us in. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today, and I, I know, Lord, that a topic such as this is unsettling. I, I spent six days preparing this, and I certainly know, uh, the, the, but it's sin, and we have to deal with sin in our lives. And so I pray, Lord, that anybody here that's struggling with anger or hatred towards any other brother or sister in their heart, Lord, that today would be the day that they would make it right with that person, with themselves, and with you, because, Lord, we know that the truth will set us free. And when we come clean with ourselves and with you, we have a burden that is lifted off of us, Father, that we can walk truly in a newness of life, unfettered by sin, unburdened by the things that we carry around. Lord, I know there's some folks here today that don't know you as Savior. I pray that you will do what only you can do, that you would convict their hearts of their sin and that you would drive them to the cross, the place, the only place that they can find forgiveness and eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and you'd like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he will do that. Salvation is a prayer away. Abundant and eternal life is available to you right now. All you have to do is turn from your sin, turn to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to the Father except through me. Maybe like Fred and Lisa and John and Willie, you need to be baptized. Uh, we would love to walk you through those steps and see you publicly identify with Christ Jesus. Maybe you'd like to join our church, or maybe you just need somebody to pray with you today. Whatever your need, please come during this time of invitation.